All right, well, welcome everybody to this second uh, edition of our second Tuesday Zoom uh, lecture series. My name is Rick Shields. I'm president uh, currently of Friends of the Savannah Coastal Wildlife Refuges, who is hosting, uh, hosting this series. Uh, this is uh, something that we've just started up doing and hopefully able to do on a, on a fairly regular basis uh, to be able to get out educational information to our, our friends and supporters, both locally and, and around the country as well. Um, I think the one of the lasting of, uh, events or impacts of the pandemic is that people are accustomed to doing this now. And I think that really opens up some opportunity for us uh, going forward to uh, continue this series. And of course, as soon as possible, we want to go to have start having some in-person events again. Um, as you guys may know, we had spent a long time doing some fundraising and actually in the construction process to build an educational pavilion at Savannah National Wildlife Refuge, which we opened with the grand opening ceremony and turned the key over to Fish and Wildlife in uh, March of 2020. And within a week, the refuge was closed down. So we've not been able to use that pavilion. It's been sitting there empty, although I think the services use it a little bit, but we've not been able to do any in-person programs. And we're very anxious to start doing that again. So uh, one of the things I'd like for to ask anybody with us here tonight, if you have ideas for future programs, uh, either in person or uh, virtual like this one, if you could uh, please uh, you put that in the chat box or send an email to me, I should, should have an email address to contact us from the invitation that you got. But we're always looking to have other other topics that we'd like to um, uh, explore. And we want to, you know, obviously come up with topics that uh, our um, members and supporters are, um, are interested in. Our next session will be on December the 14th. That'll be the last one for the year. Uh, that session will be an update from Fish and Wildlife service on uh, basically the state of the refuges um, at the end of this year, talking about the construction uh, projects that are going on, what the timeline for that is for opening, talking about the projects that we're involved with down, with the uh, community down in uh, Harris Snack, a little update. I think there's a little bit of update, a little bit of news about the road construction around Pinckney Island, uh, and just to sort of a general update on what's happening with the, you know, with the refuges. Uh, in January, we're hoping to have a representative from the National Wildlife Refuges Association join us to talk about what they do nationally in terms of supporting refuges, working with other organizations. Uh, they, they are based in D.C. They spend a lot of time talking to legislators about issues. Uh, and I'm asking them to talk to us about what the budget is for this year. The, the budget request was actually a fairly significant increase for the Fish and Wildlife Service. What's that going to mean with the backlog of, of uh, repairs and uh, on maintenance on refuges and that sort of thing. So we're looking forward to that. And uh, again, any other ideas that uh, people have for future sessions, we'd, uh, we'd appreciate that. Tonight, we are very pleased to, uh, to present uh, Diana Churchill, who is a very well known, I'm sure to many of you as a local uh, newspaper columnist, local photographer, uh, obviously a local birder, uh, an author of uh, uh, Bird's Eye View and its second, uh, second version out there now, which we do have for sale in our bookstore at the Savannah National Wildlife Refuge when it opens up again. Um, you know, Diana is, is uh, very well known in the community for many years, uh, and we sell her, her gift cards as well that feature her, uh, some of her very beautiful photographs. Uh, she's going to take over and give a presentation, um, and I'll let her introduce the topic. What I would suggest that if people have any questions about that specific bird that she's talking about, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, if you have a more general question that we can hold till the end of the session, uh, please enter it in the chat button. If you just go down and hit chat and, and um, I will keep an eye on that and take a look at those questions at the end. And when Diane is done, we'll go ahead and answer some of those questions or all of those questions if we have time for that. Um, I would um, like to, to have a little shout out. We just received a donation from the women's uh, golf at the golf club of Indigo Run. Uh, they have, uh, they're very interested in pollinators and they made a donation requesting that we specify that for the um, pollinator garden and other pollinator activities up at Pinckney Island. So thank you for that. You know, we rely on memberships and grants and donations to be able to keep up our activities. And uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to Fran Bear, who's on it with us tonight. Uh, Fran, and Denny uh, have been long-term supporters right from the very beginning of the Friends Group and always are very generous with their contribution. And uh, the, the big advantage for them is that their prior employer does a two-to-one donation match. 
So when they give us a nice donation, that really uh, you know, magnifies the impact. So any of you out there who are interested in making a donation to the friends, if you have your employer or former employer that does matching grants, we'd be more than uh, happy to help you with that to, to try to, to make that work for us if that's possible. All right, you've heard enough from me. So let's go ahead. I want to turn this over to, uh, to Diana. I'm going to make, Diana, I'm going to make you the host so that you can share your screen. Uh, and Rick, Rick do yes. we want to keep people, do we want to let people unmute so they can holler out or? You know, I think if, in, or you want to not do that? Yeah, I think if we ask everyone to, to keep themselves muted for the talk, unless they have a specific question about that bird that they, mm -hmm. so we don't have to have you keep going back and back to that stuff. So if that's, if you have a specific question about that bird, go ahead and unmute yourself and just ask the question. Uh, we're going to keep it pretty informal that way. But if it's a more general question, then that we can hold that out to the end. Okay. If that's all right okay. with everybody. All right. And Diane, I'm going to make you the host and you can take over and share your screen and take it from here. How are we doing? Can Looks fine to me. Looks, Looks fine good? to me. Yep. Okay. Well, how many of you have noticed that your bird populations are changing a little bit at the moment? So, uh, yeah, those of you who, um, once we get through October, I would say that basically our most of the, the neotropical migratory birds that have spent the spring and summer with us are on their way headed down to Central and South America. And in their place, we get a whole bunch of birds coming in that uh, they're generally coming down from places further north and they're basically spending the winter with us. So uh, it's, it's the changing of the guard. It's the, that happens every year around October, November. And so what, what this program is gonna focus on is who's coming in now and, and uh, a little bit about what habitats you might be likely to see them in. And also, I, I can't do a program without adding some sound to it. So some of their calls and, and just something to, to help you Get ready. Some of the ones are, are going to be very common. They're the ones you should see be seeing every day in your backyard. And then some of them will be a little, maybe not as familiar, but you will see them in particular habitats. So that's where we're going. And uh, in this area, we do have quite a few different habitats. We have forest, marsh, tidal creeks, rivers, agricultural fields, beaches and ponds, lagoons and lakes. So if you were gonna go out on, if let's say you decided you were gonna go out one day and try to see as many species of birds as possible in this area on a single day, your, the key to building your list would be visiting a lot of different habitats. So that you would, you could, uh, there'd be a certain set you'd see in your backyard, but then if you went to the pond, near your house, you'd add some species. And if you went over to a grassy field, you might add a few things as, 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 as you go along. So in the winter, things that typically are here that we don't see in the spring and summer, our ducks come down in the winter, our sparrows, what I call the little flitters, the little one, um, raptors. There's some hawks that come down in the winter that aren't here the rest of the year things like meadowlarks in grassy fields, pipits, snipe. So those are some of the things that we're going to be watching. And they'll have, I'll have, but I'm starting off with who might be in your yard at your feeders. And a lot of times I'd like to start out with, with uh, some sounds. So if you, uh, If you recognize things and you want to jot down what you recognize, you haven't had a piece of paper, then you can, you can test your ear a little bit. Anybody? So 
There's our handsome Northern Cardinal and his mute, but also lovely wife, muted, muted color, but also lovely wife. The, the, our little Carolina chickadee, who will often say his name by going chickadee dee dee dee, chickadee dee dee dee. These are year round residents here. So they're here all spring, all summer, all winter. And they are faithfully at your feeders, mostly eating sunflower seed. And then his cousin, Peter, 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 our little tufted titmouse. And the ever present house finches. These guys were actually introduced from the Southwest into New York City. In the, around the, in the 40s and 50s, and they were being sold as cage birds. Um, back before, back, back before the, the 70s, if you saw a reddish finch in this area, it wouldn't be a house finch, it would be a purple finch. And so some people still get a little confused and they think that they're seeing purple finches. Purple finches are a winter visitor, and usually they only come in certain winters when, when, when the what they call eruptive years, when the finches range further south. Last year was a very good year for purple finches. This year, it's not predicted to be such a good year for purple finches, but you can see how much more raspberry the male is, and you can see that big eye stripe on the female. So here's your house finches. And they're now year round residents. They spread out all over the country and they are very adaptable and they are now year round residents. And so those are your house finches. And then these are the purple finches that are here in the winter, some winters more than others. Now, these guys, they don't look like this picture on the left when they get to our, us in the winter, they, they're more drab, but they have black wings. I, when I moved back to Georgia 20 years ago, the goldfinches were the big winter event in this area. And we sold tons and tons of finch feeders with the tiny little holes that would hold the Niger seed. And everybody would be waiting, when are the finches gonna get here? My dad would put up two of those, those uh, triple tube feeders and he would think he was making money when all his condos were rented. And over the years, what's happened is not as many finches come down every year and they're changing their taste. They're not always eating the Niger. They're eating more sunflower seed. They're eating sunflower chips. They're eating safflower and Nutrisaf. And so people always start asking this year, when are, the, when are the finches gonna get here? And I always say, they're not as predictable. The winter finches are not as predictable as the spring migrants. The hummingbirds, we can always say, you know, you should be seeing your first ones around St. Patrick's Day. The finches, it's, well, sometime between November and, and January is when you might see your first goldfinch. And a lot of times if they get here and there's a lot of natural food, like sweet gumballs or other kinds of natural food, they're not necessarily going to be down at your feeders. They're going to be up eating in the trees. So I usually wait till I see the first goldfinch on my, on my sunflower seed before I go get my Niger and put my Niger out. Because Niger as a seed is, is kind of sensitive to moisture and sensitive, sensitive to temperature. And if you put it out and it sits out there for a month and you have no finches, it, you're basically just going to have to throw it away. So anyway, that is the updated story on finches. Last year was a pretty good year for goldfinches and I don't know, um, who knows what this year will bring. And sometimes mixed in with the finches, you'll see a, the, a, a bird that's streaky and brown that is the same color as the finches, but it, um, 
is brown and streaky and it kind of goes has a very buzzy call that's a pine siskin and some years we get those in big numbers and other years we don't but if you see a finch of a different color that's streaky with a little yellow on its wings then you found yourself a siskin Now, again, these guys are year-round residents. This one sounds like a little honking horn. And this one sounds like a bathtub squeaky toy. So these are our nut hatches, white-breasted and brown-headed. They're upside down birds and they'll come in for suet and, and seed and, and mealworms if you're offering. And of course this guy, most of you recognize him. At my house, they're very fond of peanuts. And not all of their calls, not all of the time do they do, do that, hear that weedle? They'll sometimes wheedle instead of doing that. Yay! Yay! Wheedle! Wheedle! And then how about this one? Mr. Belly. Poorly named woodpecker. I think he could be called the red mohawk woodpecker. And then he has a full mohawk and she has half a mohawk. And then if you're lucky, you might see some of these red-headed woodpeckers. There's a nice colony of red-headed woodpeckers over at the Savannah Christian campus. So if you get a chance to go out and do the survey over there sometime, you might see these red-headed woodpeckers. And then the little, the little one, the downy, they're always on the suet at, at my house. And they sort of, they peek, 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 and then they whinny. They whinny like a little horse. And the big guy, now Rick just told me, he told me this week that he has a pileated that comes to his feeder. Up until then, the only pileateds we heard about that were coming to feeders were on Wilmington Island in this county. My sister has them up in Virginia at her house, but I just told a bunch of people on Skidaway, don't be surprised if that behavior begins to expand. And sure enough, Rick showed me the picture of the pileated coming to his feeder on Skidaway. So. Diana, the picture I didn't get that I would have liked is I had three at one time. I think one was a fledgling and the two parents with it, but there were three of them on the on the um, the suet peanut feeder all at the same time. So the male has a red mustache and a full red crest. The female will have a half a red crest and she'll have a black mustache. Now, over here on the left, we have our winter only woodpecker. These guys, this is another one of the things that tells me that our, our bird population is changing when the first yellow bellied sapsucker comes to town. And you can see the way they drill holes. And they also have a little mew like a cat. And you look for this white stripe going down the wing. And then we do have flickers that are here year round, but the majority of them, I see more of them. I see more of them in the winter than I do in, in the summer. So that's our Pedro of, of um, Woodpecker type birds.
And of course, these, these are year round visitors. You'll see around your feeders. And also if you go out anywhere in the, in the exploring, the morning doves with their mournful cry. And then we also have now These are all around the parking lot where I work at Wild Birds Unlimited and certain places in downtown Savannah. They're the, our larger dove with the little collar, the Eurasian collar dove. Again, an, in, an, an introduced species that has now spread all over the entire country because they, they came up from one of the islands up into Florida and they've now roamed all over the whole country. Some of you might have heard that I was getting ahead of myself. And you may know, you may know that we actually have two species of crows in this area, and they're almost impossible to distinguish by visually. You have to listen to their voice. Although this one on the left does happen to be a fish crow, a little bit longer legged, a tiny bit smaller. And then we have the American crow. Now I, I say the American crow is sort of a good Southern crow because he sort of caws with a nice Southern accent. He goes, caw, 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 caw. Very civilized. The fish crow comes from New England and he doesn't caw, he caws. He pocks his car in Harvard Yard. Or he goes, nah, -uh, nah. -uh. So he's 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 very nasal. And he although you won't find fish crows mostly up in Boston, but that, that's where they sound like they came from. And then some people get confused between. Uh, crows and grackles. People will always say, I got all these blackbirds. Well, you can't just lump them all together because the crows are sort of big and stocky and they're really black. The grackles are sort of iridescent, bluish black or green or purple. This is the common grackle. And then we also have bug tail grackles. And they are longer tailed, they're slim, more slender, and they have a, do a lot of um, squawks and whistles and, and uh... And the female bow-tailed grackle is, is not iridescent at all. She's sort of a warm brown color. They sometimes, you can sometimes call them parking lot birds. In general, the common grackles are a little more inland and the boat tails are closer to the, to the ocean and to the coast. Then we have the, um, our red wings. And Mr. Red Wing is easy to identify because he's got black with red wings. But Mrs. Red Wing can be a, can, a, a puzzler. So she's brown and has a stripe over her eye, but look at that kind of pointy beak. And it, another blackbird, but this one's very small, is the brown-headed cowbird. And these are, are sort of villainous. They don't get a good reputation, but they kind of have a nice call, they burble. I think of it as a burble. So what, what's not to like about brown-headed cowbirds is that she's, she lays her eggs in other birds' nests. Um, and so, and, they, and then lets other, other birds raise her young. The other thing about many of the blackbird species is that they tend to be, they don't come singly, they come in groups. So having one or two cowbirds is not an issue, but if you have 20 cowbirds or 20 grackles, or occasionally I've seen flocks out on um, at Hutchinson Island of like three or 500 cowbirds. So if you get a huge flock of cowbirds, the I Ching has a saying, be sure abundance is desirable before wanting it. Um, a ton of salt will not sweeten your tea. 
So uh, sometimes with sometimes the tendency of these blackbird species to be in groups or to be overabundant does not work in their favor. Because everybody's like, if they only had one or two, they wouldn't be complaining and saying, how do I get rid of the blackbirds? But anyway, so going on to some of our more favorite visitors and in the in the spring and summer, our bluebirds tend to be um, tend to be in pairs. But in the fall and the winter, you can often see them in, in flocks. So it, it might not be uncommon to see a flock of 10 or 12 or 15 bluebirds all hanging out together, which is kind of nice. Or you'll see a little group of five or six all on the wire. And, and they have this nice little warbly kind of, kind of call. And then another bird that tends to come to feeders in the winter around here, it, and if you see something bright yellow in the winter, the tendency, the first thing people think is, oh, the goldfinches are here. But unfortunately, the goldfinches aren't yellow in the winter. So the thing that's going to be bright yellow in the winter and coming to your feeders is more than likely a pine warbler. And look at the beak, the difference in the beak. It's a skinny little insect eating beak instead of a conical seed eating beak. And the goldfinch is gonna have a really, really dark black wing. So, and pine warblers, that's an male, adult male. This is a juvenile. You couldn't tell by the color, but you can see the wing bars. You can see the little um, ring around the eye. You can see the same kind of beak. So that's um, our, and they, they will often be very obliging and they'll sing right before they come in to eat suet or mealworms at your feeder. And they have a nice trill. Another bird that has a trill call that can be very confusing, but we don't hear it as much in the winter, is this little chipping sparrow. And the chipping sparrows come in flocks in the winter and they will eat white millet. They are very fond of coming to your feeder in groups and chowing down on white millet. So if your painted buntings leave, your chipping sparrows may come in and take over eating your white millet. Now, another change, as we've had fewer goldfinches coming in the winter, we now are having more and more Orioles, Baltimore Orioles spending the winter here. Um, 15 years ago, it was pretty unusual. Actually, when we first did the Savannah Christmas count, if you reported a Baltimore Oriole, it was highlighted as being rare. Now, like Ardsley Park is kind of a big Oriole haven. There's lots of Orioles visiting feeders there. My parents are in Magnolia Park. They can have anywhere from five to 20 Orioles visiting all season. Um, Judy, do you have them down there where you are yet? Not Nicole does. Nicole has some in Richmond Hill. That's this was the adult male. And then these are the females, female and juvenile. So he's very, um, very showy. But they're um anything bigger than a cardinal, about bigger than a cardinal that's kind of yellow orange, and you might be might have yourself an Oriole. They like to eat grape jelly, they like to eat mealworms, they like to drink hummingbird nectar, they'll sometimes eat suet, they'll sometimes eat sunflower chips. So that's our Baltimore Orioles. Now these are the our little um, our, our year-round loudmouths. They will, I always think of them as the uh, town criers. They will catch everybody up on all the bird gossip. And they'll also poke around and eat spiders and then they'll find strange places to nest. So these are our little year-round Carolina wrens and our year-round Georgia state bird, Mr. Brown Thrasher. And his cousin, the mockingbird. Now the mockingbirds tend to say their phrases four to six times, while the brown thrashers tend to do couplets. Northern mockingbird. Oops, sorry. The brown thrasher does couplets, and he's got sort of a rasp, like a Scottish burr, like a 
it, it's sort of raspy compared to the mockingbird that's a little more a little more clear and he says things more times and the mockingbird sometimes will sing at night which can be annoying so we're moving out of your backyard a little bit here and we're going to go into our maritime forest our live oaks and Spanish moss and all of that sort of habitat. And some of the, here are what I call our little flitters, the little flitters that can be hard to find in the maritime forest because they're very good at just flitting around in the oak trees. The, um, but sometimes you can hear them. This guy is the blue-headed vireo. And he says, here I am, where are you? Where are you? And sometimes he fusses. And then over here on the on the right, we've got a little our little blue gray gnat catcher, and they have a very high pitched call. I can always sort of judge how my hearing is doing if I can hear the gnat catchers. And usually, my friend Pam, who's younger than I am, hears them before I do. So I know I'm, I'm my, my, my high pitched hearing is not as good as it used to be. And then if I really want to test my high pitched hearing, I have to test it on these golden crown kinglets. Can you hear how high that is? We saw some of these beautiful golden crown kinglets on uh, this weekend. It was out at the, um, the Evans County public fishing area of all places. But the Solomon Tract, which has got a lot of nice maritime forests, is also a good place to find these golden crown kinglets. And they're a species that's pretty much only here in the winter, the same as the blue-headed vireos, and with the ruby crown kinglets. Now, the ruby crowns are a little easier to see and hear than the golden crowns. And they, they're just tiny. If they get fussed up, they'll flash their crown at you, and they'll often flick their wings. And they will occasionally come and, and drink hummingbird nectar, and they'll occasionally come and eat grape jelly. Also in the maritime forest, and occasionally coming to feeders, once in a while, we have a couple of some warbler species. This is our black and white warbler, or the zebra striped warbler. And he often sounds like a, a Volvo that's um, trying to put its brakes on, a squeaky wheel. And then the beautiful yellow-throated warbler. The yellow, we have a lot of yellow-throated warblers that are breeding here in the spring and summer, but we have a small number that do stay around for the winter. And when he flashes that, and they do sometimes come in and eat suet. When he flashes that gorgeous throat, it's just, uh, that's like the sunrise. And a very nondescript warbler that I thought was poorly named this is called the orange crown warbler. Only once have I ever seen the orange crown. I got to watch one at um, take a bath once. And when he took a bath, he flashed his orange crown. But no wing bars, kind of grayish, a little yellow, a little yellow right under the tail. So he's one of the, our seven warbler species that do spend the winter here. Now this guy, I, I affectionately call him Hermy. He's a hermit thrush. I have one that they, there's one that comes and likes to eat under my feeders and but you see him also out in the forest. He, the, he's most of the other thrushes are either migrate through or are here in the summer, but Hermes our winter thrush and he has a little rusty tail and um, nice little um, spots. And he also, he makes, a, in the winter, they don't sing as much, but they have this little chuck noise that they make. Let's see if I can find his little chuck noise. Just a little chuck, 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 chuck. Their song is beautiful, beautiful. But we often don't get to hear that unless you hear him in the spring on their breeding territories. And these guys are out in the maritime forest and right now they're courting. 
I heard them in my neighborhood last night. It's a it's a wonderful. Um, and if you listen closely, you can hear her. He has a deeper voice, and hers is slightly higher. And this is our great horned owl. We were speculating because usually he comes into the territory first and he hoots and he tries to get her to come into the territory. So I made up a new song last night. If any of you know Bob Marley, it was, I don't want to hoot in vain for your love. I don't want to hoot in vain for your love. <laughs> So hopefully she'll be back on territory soon and they'll raise some new outlets. Diana, that was amazing. That was perfect. <laughs> and here's our great little screech owl. These are not as common as they used to be. I have heard them around Kingfisher Pond at the Savannah Wildlife Refuge. So moving into our coastal scrub, are y'all hanging in there or are we getting too, too tired? So this is, this is our, one of our little winter only wrens. This is the little house wren. I call it the little fuss budget wren because he's always kind of, getting fussed up and crabby and and making little scratchy little fussy noises. It's a drier call than the Carolina wren. And then the, another one that likes to fuss back in the shrubbery is the white-eyed vireo. Chick, I'm a vireo, chick. But he's fond of fussing as well. And these are year round residents, but I seem to see and hear them more in the winter. Drink your tea, drink your tea, drink your tea. Or once they're done saying drink your tea, drink your tea, they'll say, Toei, Toei, they'll tell you who they are. And a couple of more little warblers. This, these are mostly in the, in the um, wetlands, the little common yellow throat, the little black bandit mask warbler who says, witchity, witchity, witchity. And then, of course, these guys are just like everywhere, all in the wax myrtle. They used to call them myrtle warblers, but now they're called yellow rumped warblers or affectionately butterbutts. And they're just all in the wax myrtle and, and they'll, they respond to pishing. If you go, psh, 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 then usually six or eight or 10 yellow rumps will come up to see what's going on. And we have sparrows, the little brown jobbies that come down for the winter. You have to become a connoisseur to learn your sparrows. So um, if you wanna expand your bird list in the winter, sparrows are important. This is a song sparrow, beautiful call. And here's, he's got streaking on the breast. So with sparrows, you wanna pay attention to, does it have streaking? Is it plain, streak breasted or plain breasted? Sort of like if anybody's feel familiar with the sneeches, Dr. Seuss, there were sneeches with stars and sneeches who had none upon stars. So we have sparrows with streaks and sparrows without streaks. Here's a non-streaked sparrow. This is the white-throated sparrow. And I just saw one of these at my parents' house on the deck yesterday. Sometimes they sing in the winter. It's a beautiful little song. Oh, Sam, Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. And then another winter 
spring and winter, uh, uh, fall and winter visitor. These are gray catbird, all pewter gray, a little yamaki and some rust under his tail. And if so, if you hear, if you hear a bush meow at you, then you found a catbird. And these guys are around most of the winter. And contrary to popular opinion, they don't just eat worms. They also eat a lot of berries. As do these, these berry bandits who come in flocks. Also another high pitch call to test your uh, hearing the cedar wax wings and they'll come in big flocks and strip your berries in the winter. They don't breed here, but they come and roam around in nice flocks. So moving to the forest, we'll have some of the same species that we already talked about. Brown headed nuthatches love pine forest as do pine warblers. Brown creepers, now there is a, a cryptic bird. It, anybody, can anybody see the bird in the left side of that picture? You see how well he blends into the bark of the pine tree? Here, so I'm, they just are hard to find. But, um, and also another high pitch call. And they have a habit of flying, they, they creep up to the top of the tree and then they turn around and fly back down to the bottom and creep back up again. Moving to the floodplain forest, here's our other, our other large owl species, the barred owl. Now these, these are in Forsyth Park. They're in my parents' neighborhood. So they're, they're in lots of different habitats in addition to the floodplain forest. And they do sometimes sound like monkeys. Again, your little flitters. I always like to review these. They're in some of that same habitat. Your blue-headed vireo, your golden crown kinglet, your blue-gray gnatcatcher, and your ruby crown kinglet. Open fields. Um, Fort Pulaski has some great open fields. Hutchinson Island has some great open fields. A uh, good place uh, at Oatland, they have some nice fields where they find Eastern meadowlarks in the winter. Also, Phoebe's. This is another one that has, says his name for us. This is our winter flycatcher and they pump their tail. They often sit on a perch and pump their tail. And they say, Phoebe, Phoebe. And then snipe. There really is such a thing as a snipe. I don't know if any of you ever went on a snipe hut when you were growing up, but the, the snipe is actually a shorebird. That's its winnowing call. Um, that long beak, they, they get all kinds of yummy invertebrates with that beak. And they, they fly very, very fast. The, the term, you have to be a very good shot to hit a snipe. And so the term sniper sort of came from that. So this is our Wilson snipe that you can find usually in damp, moist fields is where, what they like. And then um, also this another little winter warbler, the little palm warblers. They have a little yellow under their tail, a little rusty cap, and they're sort of yellowish on the breast. And, they're, and then this is a sort of a, a, a sought after species in the winter, the American pipit. And they, they also wander around in, in grassy or muddy fields. So I challenge you to look for a pipit this winter. They do have a call that sort of goes pipit, pipit, pipit. And more sparrows on the left, streak-breasted, the savannah sparrow. And 
clear breasted, again, our little chipping sparrow. Another one that you'll find around open fields, the loggerhead shrike. Shrikes are nicknamed the butcher bird because they are a predatory songbird. They'll take insects and little rodents and even birds and they will hang them in the spring. They'll cache their prey and then they'll display for their mate in front of their cache, like saying, look, honey, I can provide for you. You're, you want to mate with me because look, you're, your kids are going to be well fed. They have an interesting sort of call too. Lake Mayer is a, the, is a good place to find shrikes. Um, Savannah Christian, we usually see one over there as well. And then actually when we were going to Savannah Christian to do the survey on Sunday, on the goalpost on by on one of their foot their football field, one goalpost had a shrike on it, and the other uh, goalpost had a kestrel on it. And we saw them later on another field on a different goalpost. They seem to have been hunting buddies. So the kestrel is um, nice to have around in the winter. As are the red-shouldered hawks. Now these are year round, but they're here all winter. And red-tailed hawks. That's the tail, here's the shoulder. Red tail. The shoulder does sort of a paired very shrill call and the red tail does more of a one long scream kind of call. And then if you're lucky, maybe you'll see the Cooper's hawk. More slender with long tails. Around the lakes, pond and lagoons. This guy, Our kingfisher. Aspreys. American coots. <laughs> and common gallinules. <laughs> to me, they always sound like teenagers that are whining that they don't want to clean their rooms. No, 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 no. I'm not gonna clean my room. <laughs> and then who would think that this little bird would sound like this? If we're lucky, we in the spring, we might hear the pie bill greaves sounding like monkeys. We have ducks that come in for the winter. Mallards. Wood ducks that squeal. Northern shovelers with their big shovel bills. Blue wing teal. Is this, is this thing in the way for you guys? Or can you not see it? Looks fine. Okay. Little perky tailed ruddy ducks. Hooded mergansers. These guys, as we get closer toward the end of winter and spring, they'll start courting with this crazy sort of sound. Wah, wah. He fills his throat up and throws his head back and goes, wah, wah. 
Great way for a guy to get a girl, don't you think? And then we have scop. And ring neck ducks. And moving into the salt marsh. The voice of the salt marsh, I think, the clapper rail. One of our one of our winter only hawks, the northern harrier, look for that big white patch on his tail. Little bufflehead out in the in the tidal creeks, Mr. and Mrs. And loons. The common loon and We don't often get to hear them because they're not breeding down here, but it's such a wonderful call. And then the red-throated loon is slightly smaller with a tilted up head. And last but not least, Judy's favorite with his whippy little call, This was actually taken at, at the pond behind one of those hotels near the airport. And this eagle was harrying this group of coots that were in that pond. So that's probably our little Gulf Stream eagle. Yeah. All righty, y'all made it all the way through. So Rick, you can solicit questions. All right, we've got one question in the chat box and that was from Lori and she wants to know, do we get ravens here along the coast, either as full-time or transients? Generally, no. For ravens, you've got to go up to the north part of the state, um, up into the mountains, basically. Brasstown Ball, way up there, up in the, in the mountains is where you're gonna to have to go to find your ravens. Down here, it's pretty much crows. All right. Well, any other questions that people have? Uh, I think the, uh, the the test is we had no one dropped out of the uh, of the of the uh, session while you were doing it. So we had the same number of people on on the call. So uh, we did have a question just came in from Judy Johnson uh, asking about uh, peregrine falcons. Do we have peregrine falcons in this area? Um, that's a good question, Judy. We do. They're typically more um, coming through on migration. So in the, in the, like from September through November, they're more, more common to find the peregrines as, as they're migrating through. Um, let me, in fact, I saw one at Tybee a couple of weeks ago and it was, um, they will come down along the coast. That's the way, that's where they migrate. Some of the raptors like the, um, the, the buteos, the red shoulders and the, and the um, red tails, they migrate more inland and they migrate um, using the thermals. The uh, falcons tend to migrate right along the coast more. So we always see them at Jekyll um, when we're when we have the if we have a either the festival or when we have the GOS meeting along at Jekyll in the fall. Um, but I did see one at Tybee, and they they do prey on the shorebirds that um, that are staging along the coast as well. One thing that's interesting about the falcons is they're now. They're, they've now been reclassified in the field guide, so, so they're no longer with the hawks. They're in a they're in a separate in a separate uh, little category by themselves. Um, so, well, also Diana Paul asked, uh, "Don't forget the Sun City Limpkin." Ah, yes, the <laughs> Sun City Limpkin. Yeah, Limpkins, I wouldn't call them a regular winter visitor in the area, 
but they are beginning to have more of a presence here. My friend Pam lives at Sun City and she had a, a I mean, not Sun City, she lives in Southbridge on a little lagoon and she had a Lemkin stop at her lagoon. She thinks it's been at least twice. And so you say there's one in Sun City now? The other, yeah. uh, I remember. Yeah. Go, go we ahead, have Paul. two of them. Yeah. This, yeah, this is Cherry Underwood. I had one in my backyard about a <laughs> month true. ago. Really? Yeah. I and just you... happened to look out onto the lagoon and there it was. So I have some photos of it. Cool. He's been here a couple of times. Pam said it was eating some kind of mussels. And the second time she just thought it had been there, she didn't see it, but she saw these mussels that were had been eaten and, and opened in the same way as it had said that's when it was there the first time. Well, Diana, I remember a few years back taking a trip out to Tyvee to see a snowy owl that was living on the roof of one of the hotels out there. How often do we get those come through? Well, I've been back in Savannah 22 years, Rick, and that was that was 2013, and that's the only year I've seen a snowy owl on Tybee. So not very often. <laughs> not very often. It was that was a year when lots. And so it's it, it's a little more common for them to range range like down into New England and the upper parts of the United States. But that evidently that was a, uh, I think the year before that they'd had a really, really busy, uh, no, really productive snowy owl winter up on the tundra. And there were so many young snowy owls that they just, there wasn't enough food for them up there. And they all just kind of came south. A lot of them came south and a lot of them came way much, way further south than usual. But I would say that's once in 22 years that we've had one on Tybee. Well, I count myself lucky. I was able to go out there and uh, get a look at it. All right, does anybody else have any questions? We're right about at an hour now. Uh, anybody else have any questions for Diana before we uh, end, sh shut this down? I'd like to thank again, Diana, very much for the uh, for your presentation. The fact that we had everybody who logged on stayed the entire time. Uh, that's always a, a sign that you, you, you've put on a good program. Really appreciated all of the, uh, the voices as well. Uh, it's uh, so helpful uh, to be able to put the, uh, the picture together with the bird's call and uh, to help you identify it when you're sitting out there and you can in your yard and you can hear this. You can hear them, but you can't see them. And it's always helpful to be able to ID, ID them that way. Um, all right, so uh, unless well, anybody- I thank all of you. This is um, sort of my first time doing a Zoom. I couldn't tell if anybody was falling asleep or not, so. Uh. <laughs> well, we appreciate the, the time very much and we look forward to continuing working with you in the future and to selling some of your books once we get our store reopened again, finally, whenever, that, whenever that's going to be. So uh, again, thank you. A number of thank yous coming in from our visitors, from the, uh, the viewers here. Uh, remember next month on December 14th, uh, same time, the second Tuesday at 7 p.m., we're gonna be doing that State of the Refuges update by, uh, I'm not sure which one of the uh, refuge uh, staff is gonna be putting that on just yet. They're still working on their schedule. Um, and then uh, the, they'll get an announcement about that ahead of time. And, and the same way you'll register for it and then get a reminder the night before to, to join in. So, and please, if anybody has any uh, suggestions for um, oh, nice future- Nice uh, there. Yeah. Any suggestions for future for future topics, uh, please let me know. This could be either for uh, a Zoom meeting like this or for a, an in-person topic at some point. Or if you're in an organization that would like to hear from, uh, you know, from the Friends Group or from Fish and Wildlife, let me know. You know, uh, you know Will Meeks, who is the project, manager, the project leader at Savannah Coastal Refuges, he and I are giving a presentation to the um, CCA out here on Skidaway Island uh, in January talking about, uh, you know, kind of similar topics, the state of the refuge what a friends group is, how you can help, that sort of thing. So if you're in an organization that uh, you'd like to hear from us, you'll just contact us and we can uh, be happy to have a speaker either from the friends group or from 
uh, fish and wildlife or both, we can tag team it and do it that way as well. Another question, uh, Vicki's asking if uh, this video will be online. Uh, yes, give me a couple of days. Again, I'm traveling tomorrow, but uh, by the weekend, I should have this up on our YouTube channel and I'll put out another uh, newsletter announcing the next session and giving the link on how to view this on our YouTube channel as well. Again, that's something new that we just started doing. The uh, We're gonna start putting all of these up on there and any other videos that come in that we think might be of, uh, of interest to people too. So anybody else have anything to add for the good of the group? Otherwise, we can uh, wrap this up. Thank you very much for everybody who attended. Uh, please, you know, if you think this was worthwhile, let your friends and neighbors and uh, other folks let them know about this uh, video, this session. Um, and again, if you need to, if you want to look at it again, I'll get that link out and you can send that out to people who maybe missed tonight's session and you think would be interested. So again, thanks to Diana. Thanks to all the board members who have worked on this to help make this a reality. And uh, I will say good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.